So volatility is an issue, obviously. If you're talking about a charity that has Bitcoin holdings, there's the potential for somebody to donate Bitcoin to the charity and then some time passes and the Bitcoin is worth a different amount or has a different amount of um, purchasing power than it had when it was initially donated. And this could work in both ways, right? Like the, the assets could grow. So there's sort of an incentive for the charity maybe to save and to uh, be to really think about how they spend their Bitcoin or not. Or or Bitcoin could crash and then it could those donations could kind of shrink. You know, how do you see BitGive, I guess, dealing with that volatility factor? It sounds like you're splitting the holdings between Bitcoin and, and other currency currently. But is that sort of the long term strategy to mitigate the volatility? You know, that's a really good question. A lot of these things we're still trying to find, um, you know, figure out a long term strategy and how we will address these things. But the short term, we are holding the donations we've received and they have gone up significantly. Even with the latest dip, they're still seven times over what they were when we received them. Right. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> right. Which is great. And, you know, until we have a process established for where, you know, how to decide where these funds go, we do plan to sit on those um, until we have a process established or some project comes along that makes a lot of sense. You know, it's it's a really good question. I think there are a lot of things we've been talking about at the board level about do we set a threshold below which we don't cash them out? Or do we do first coins in or first coins out? It's a very, very, very good question. And I think there's a lot of ways we could handle it. And we really haven't identified exactly how we will proceed. Um, it, you know, it's just very complicated. You know, for but one, for one example, though, just um, we did do the Save the Children drive for Bitcoin Black Friday, and that was really straightforward because it was one day, and we said everything we get this day is going to them, and it was for the Philippines relief effort, so the need is immediate. It's very acute. We're not waiting. We're going to give them the money right away. So mm-hmm. that was very straightforward for us. So you took in Bitcoin donations and then converted it to fiat currency and then sent that to the Philippines? Or did you send the Bitcoins to someone in the Philippines and they converted it? How did that work? No, what we did was we converted the funding to our U.S. dollar currency and then donated to them in their traditional do their traditional avenues, but they were oh. aware that it was coming from the Bitcoin community and that we were exchanging Bitcoins to send them fiat. So they are actually very close to probably accepting Bitcoin directly. But Save the Children is an extremely large, you know, international, well-known charity and yes. they have a lot of questions and their, you know, legal folks and their finance folks have a lot of T's to cross and I's to dot. But they are, I think, going to be directly accepting Bitcoin pretty shortly. So then we could actually, you know, be able to donate to them in Bitcoin, which would be really cool. Is part of the idea to increase acceptance of Bitcoins among accepting among existing charities? Um, you know, it's not a formal part of our mission, but it is something that just sort of naturally comes with the work. And I think it's fun, actually, because it's really interesting to get people more educated and knowledgeable about Bitcoin, helping them accept it in, in donations. You know, there's BitPay and I think Coinbase, too, and other services that process donations in Bitcoin for free for charities. And so it's really easy to kind of promote the use of it or help educate charities about using it. And it just kind of naturally comes with what we do. I don't see what the problem would be for a large existing charity if they were to use a payment processor like BitPay or Coinbase, where the Bitcoin could be immediately converted into fiat, then they wouldn't even have to have a Bitcoin address, really. They just all they do is just put this little API on their website and then they get dollars, but people can donate them to them using Bitcoins. Exactly. It's really a low barrier to entry for them. I think it, sh- it would just be another way to accept uh, donations. But there are some charities out there who specifically deal in Bitcoin and they, they don't really use payment processors or anything like that. Like, for instance, you know, Sean's Outpost is a really well-known example and, and Free Aid, the one that I work with. 
They just accept Bitcoins directly. And there is sort of an enthusiasm, I think, among the Bitcoin community for charities that do that because they're kind of keeping things in Bitcoin and then they're they're only going outside of the Bitcoin economy when they really, really have to. Yeah. And I mean, we're very supportive of that. And, you know, one of the things that I've been trying to do is just be a leader in the community to try to just draw more attention to the fact that charities can accept Bitcoin, can use Bitcoin. The community can be giving and donating um, and just kind of getting that message out there more and being a leader in the community in that sense. But yeah, I think one th- there's a lot of potential. So there's a lot more to be done. And I know groups like BitPay or companies like BitPay are out there actually trying to bring in charities to work with them. Even mm-hmm. though they do it for free, they're really proactively trying to bring in more. So, yeah, you know, one thing that's getting easier, and if you were to operate a charity in in Bitcoin exclusively, meaning you you uh, accepted donations in Bitcoins and then the holdings of the charity were in Bitcoin, it's kind of cool because it's getting easier and easier to buy things with Bitcoin. So, for instance, you could pay for your web hosting. You could pay for all of your website services with Bitcoin if you're a charity who holds Bitcoin. You could purchase medical supplies, for instance. You can now get gift cards on Gift that you can use to shop at CVS, Target, Amazon if you're in the U.S. You could get first aid supplies. You could get food, potentially. All kinds of things that charities could do using Bitcoin to purchase items that they need to operate, basically. So I'm excited to see that getting more feasible, I guess, for charities to do. Absolutely. Yeah, it's really exciting. I guess with the 501c3 application, I just wanted to return to that for a minute. I'm really curious what the IRS is going to say. And so for our listeners who are international, who, who aren't familiar with the, with this term 501c3, it's a designation that the the IRS, the U.S. government agency that wants to tax everybody here in the U.S., you can get an exemption if you are a charitable organization and people can donate to the charity and deduct it from their taxes, from their taxable income. But you have to ask them for it. You have to you have to put together a letter and an application. And it's a very long process, you know, saying this is why we're a charity and here's da 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 to prove it. And then they will either say yay or nay and come back to you. But they have all these requirements, you know, they want you to be structured a certain way in terms of the organization's corporate structure. One of the things about nonprofit recognition by the government in the U.S. is I believe that the process is different for churches and religious organizations. So I've yet to see someone start the Church of Satoshi or the Church of Bitcoin and say, look at us, you know, we're <laughs> we're nonprofit. We don't have to uh, apply for this, but I'm sure that's coming. I'm sure somebody will do that at some point. But, uh, you know, you do have to kind of put together this whole application, which really is not geared for Bitcoin organizations. It's geared for dollars and conventional bank accounts and uh, things like that. Were you involved at all with putting together the application for this? And like, how was it adapted to reflect that you're a Bitcoin organization? I guess is what I'm wondering. Uh, that's a good question. You have lots of great questions. <laughs> thank you. Well, this is something that I'm really interested in. So I'm, I'm glad and, and thank you for... Um, you know, sharing all your experience and expertise on this. I really appreciate you talking about it. I think we're all blazing new trails here. So, you know, as much as we can share with each other and learn as we go, the better. Yes. Yeah. We work very closely with a, a law firm, per- Perkins Coy, and they're providing us their pro bono services to get this um, organization established. There's a fair amount of paperwork that needs to be done there. And then with this IRS um, process. And so we have a really dynamite attorney who's her entire career has been helping establish uh, foundations and nonprofits in the U.S. And so she's very well experienced in that. And then we also have on our. Does she know about Bitcoin? Does she familiar with Bitcoin? And well, no, but we have on our team from them as well another attorney who is familiar with Bitcoin. And so he's providing that sort of aspect of the whole situation. So they are teaming up together and putting their putting their minds together on all of our paperwork. So I think they, they could probably answer the questions a lot better than I could. But my impression of the process was that we really applied as much of existing rules and, and process as there is in place already for charities and nonprofits and try to figure out how and where best to indicate that Bitcoin 
aspects of what we're doing. And um, we'll see what they have to say when they come back with, you know, their response to our application. But it also, I think, it made it really easy that um, we were just brand new and they ask for a lot of financials, which we don't really have a whole lot of financials because we're brand new. So I think maybe many groups are functioning for some time and have budgets and and the like that they can use when they apply for a C3 status, whereas we're applying for it out the gate. And it's pretty simple right now. You know, we don't have a a lot. We haven't even finished one budget cycle. So (laughs) I'm really curious to see how that goes. And I guess just for our listeners who who may not know this story, Free Aid actually at one point, the charity that I work with, filed for recognition of 501c3 status with the IRS. And we had some issues with our application and we kind of just uh, decided not to pursue it after a while because it wasn't fitting in. And we operate uh, just basically in Bitcoin. And we're a very small charity, so perhaps size is a factor there too. But... I'm really curious to see what they they have to say when an attorney prepares the uh, the statement and stuff. And <laughs> yeah, absolutely, we are too, and we're really curious to see how long it takes them to respond as well. Yeah, it can be a long process for sure, in my experience. So keep us posted on that. And one one last question for you, Connie. I hate to do this if you're not comfortable talking about it. Just say say so, and we don't have to you know put this in. But I'm just curious, kind of what your experiences are. I remember meeting you for the first time and we kind of like looked at each other from across the room and we were like, oh my God, it's another woman at the Bitcoin conference. (laughs) And, you know, I'm sure you've noticed that the Bitcoin community is pretty um, skewed male, right? And not that that there's anything wrong with that, right? Like that's just where where we're at right now as a community and we love the guys that are involved in Bitcoin, but they're just, the fact remains that there just aren't as many women what have your experiences sort of been as a woman who's interested in Bitcoin? And like, do you have anything you want to share that's related to that? Well, sure. It's funny that you mentioned that when we first met, because I really was overwhelmed by the fact that I was at this large conference and it was 98% male. And there were very few women. And when I saw you, it was like an oasis. I'm like, Oh my God, there's another woman. This is really, so I, it, you know, that was just in May, and and I've seen it change even, you know, since then. But there's, it's still maybe now 96 percent male. So you know, it's still quite heavily uh, weighed in that direction. And you know, it's understandable. It's a programming world. It's a finance world, and traditionally those are you know male um, focused career paths, if you will. But there's a lot of women in those fields, and I would love to see them step up and be more involved in the Bitcoin community. But there's also a lot of other aspects of Bitcoin that I think you know women can come in and provide a more well-rounded community. And, and people are starting to call the Bitcoin space is now the Bitcoin ecosystem. And, you know, I think that's a much more realistic ex- explanation of how a, a, a community really needs to be working. And it opens up a lot of opportunity for different things to be happening, like charitable giving and like more, you know, women in the space. And it's, you know, there's a there's a whole lot of opportunity. I think I have met quite a few amazing women who are in the Bitcoin space or the Bitcoin ecosystem. And, um, you know, they're really passionate about what they're doing and they want to see more women involved as well. Uh, there's actually a group called Women in Bitcoin that um, is, is new and just getting started. But it's a gal from Trade Hill as well as BitPay who co-founded it. And uh, they're on Facebook and Twitter. And I think they're trying to really pull together a community. And they're not being exclusive to just women as far as being involved in the group. Um, but I think they're, yeah, it's you know, not like a secret club. It's just you know, hey, we're we're here and we we are in the Bitcoin community. So come join us. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And just promoting that, you know, getting getting the word out a little more that you know, promoting more women in Bitcoin, and and we welcome men to be involved in that as well. So working in the nonprofit space uh, outside of Bitcoin, you know, in the in the uh, conventional economy. 
what does what is the gender balance like there? Is it? I'm kind of picturing for some reason that it's more female dominated, but I could be wrong about that. It, it is actually. It's it's pretty female dominated in the nonprofit world and especially in the environmental world. So yeah, it's almost like. I have two completely different, but yet yin and yang related careers going on here. <laughs> right. Yeah. It must be really interesting to see, you know, you kind of cross over from the dollar world to the Bitcoin world. And, and then suddenly there's a, there's a very uh, noticeable gender difference, right? <laughs> between exactly. those two, two places. Absolutely. Have you personally, like, have you introduced anybody in your life to Bitcoin that maybe not people who are working with you on BitGive, but just just randomly people yeah uh, friends yeah tell me about that absolutely yes well a lot of people think oh you know, that they see it on my facebook i'm always posting things on facebook or i'm talking about it and so they have a lot of questions and those kinds of things um i just talked to someone at a party last night about all this and People are fascinated, but I also um, helped a girlfriend of mine actually buy some Bitcoins and sell her Bitcoins when they went up in value. And so that was a really fun experience. And, and you know, a lot of this is new for me, too. I'm not a Bitcoin expert by any means. So uh, it's been really fun and exciting and interesting to just keep up with what's going on in, in the media. That's a lot of what my friends and, and family ask about as well. So, you know, actually... Tell me about what's going to go on for BitGive in the in the new year, maybe. Like, are you planning any campaigns or are you going to kind of maybe respond to the need in terms of if there are any natural disasters that happen or what's what's the plan for BitGive in the next couple months? That's, that's a good question. Um, well, right now we're in a process of evaluating our resources and we're pursuing quite a bit of opportunities. So my first focus is going to be on looking at capacity building funding. As I mentioned earlier, you know, I'm just kind of working on this on the side as a volunteer and our resources are pretty limited. So that's my first priority is to start looking for funding that can help us really get off the ground and have, make sure we have the resources we need to really get going and make things happen. And in addition to that, of course, we're always looking for funding for the charitable causes that we'd like to give to. So that's really important as well. And we have a board meeting in the early in the new year. And one of the things we'll be talking about is what I what I would like to propose to the board is that we set up a two prong process or structure, if you will, for giving. One is is that we have the short term projects like if there is a need for disaster relief funds. We hope there isn't, but of course those things do happen, that we can be poised to do things like that, as well as doing sort of quarterly drives for chosen charities. So each quarter we may choose one environmental and one public health campaign to run, and they will just be running all quarter, and then we would switch them on a quarterly basis. And then on the long-term side is really where the big vision and bold stuff comes in, and you know, we want to build a multi-million dollar, you know, almost like an endowment, but we're not officially going to be operating as an endowment because it's very limited when you do that, that you have to only give to charitable causes and operate off of the gains. And the, the, the bulk of the funding has to sit and not be touched. You know, we would have to have, I forgot, forget now what the calculations I had, but they were in, in the 10 to multi tens of millions of dollars in order for us to be able to even donate if at all. Um, Which might not be impossible with Bitcoin. Right. <laughs> Just it's, keep it, holding yeah. on. It'd be really cool if we could actually be a real true endowment and in that, you know, we were able to raise the amount of money and the value is going up so much that we can actually operate in that way. But I think feasibility wise for now, we're just kind of following that as a as a as a model in the sense of we'd like to be bringing in long term donations that we do sit on and that do go up in value. And we also give off of those gains, but not being constrained by the legal requirements of, you know, only being able to operate and provide giving on those gains. Um, so essentially, you know, we, we are looking at doing short term projects so that we have pro actively we're have we're actively giving and at, over the long term collecting funds that would go into this sort of endowment pool, if you will, 
that we would also give off from that source as well, but in a, in a much more long-term, sustainable kind of fashion. Right. I could uh, almost envision sort of a drive where, you know, maybe the board selects a couple of charities that uh, people could support and then they vote with their Bitcoins by sending to a certain address of like, which one do you want the donations to go to? And then everybody wins and it's kind of like a fun gamified thing. That sounds fun. I like that they vote with Bitcoins. That's (laughs) awesome. Yeah, that's a cool idea. Yeah, It's been fun talking to folks about this because it is kind of a new idea in the ecosystem and people have all kinds of neat ideas like like that. Um, so I'm just collecting them and seeing what we can, you know, what kinds of things we can do and bringing different opportunities to the board as well. So it's exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So anything else you want to add before we wrap it up? I think that we've covered a, a lot. I mean, I really appreciate the time and, you know, I just would love folks to check us out if they have a few moments. So we have a website, biggivefoundation.org. We'd love for you to check us out and we update that pretty regularly as far as what kinds of things we're doing. We're also on Facebook and Twitter, so you can follow us on a more active basis and see what we're doing. We'd love, you know, donations as well. And that's really easy to do on our website. And as I mentioned earlier, too, I mean, we're looking for help, volunteers, if you're interested in being on our board. It's a new new organization. There's lots of opportunities. So anybody who's interested, I encourage you to get a hold of me and we can talk. And you can reach Connie at info at bitgivefoundation.org. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Connie Gallippi, thank you so much for chatting with me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Stephanie. It's been a pleasure. Hi, listener. Here at Let's Talk Bitcoin, we're building a global network of correspondents able to contribute on the ground perspective when cryptocurrency related information comes across their filters. If you'd like to join our global conversation, send an email with your name and geographic or cultural niche to apply at letstalkbitcoin.com. Just like Bitcoin, the only barrier to entry is your time and good work. Thanks for listening.